How many of you have not met my dad? <laughs> the, only person, the only person who hasn't, who hasn't met my dad. Okay, well. He's kind of Josh. Yeah. <laughs> he hasn't even met me, much less my dad. Barely. Um, okay, if most of you don't know my dad very well, some of you don't know my dad very well. Correct. Al, let me ask you. How many times have you met him? I think I've talked to him twice. I mean, I've seen him in several services. I've talked to him twice. A couple of times. Just real okay. briefly. So just from what you, just general whatever you know, how do you think we're similar? Well, I mean, you, you both have, talking to him, you both have a passion for God. You both love God. You both have a passion for sharing that with other people. Um, anything else? I, I I don't really know that I've talked to him enough to to pick up. That's cool. Picked up. That's cool. Tammy, what do you think? Just just the thought. How are I we? Think you both have a very strong um, commitment to family. Mm -hmm. yeah. A very strong love for your family, commitment to your family. Okay, those are both very good qualities. Thank you. Okay. Family. <laughs> okay, Chris, you're dying to say it. How do you think we're similar? Y'all have the same corny jokes. And the downside? No. Same Sometimes. corny jokes. Sometimes. Well, thanks for all that. <laughs> no, on a serious note, your faith, your faithfulness in your walk with God. Well, it's I have unabandoned. It's kind of like you don't turn back. You walk that straight and narrow, and that's a good influence. You both seem very persistent, but in different ways. Cool. I'm, I'm not fishing for compliments, seriously. <laughs> um, I have a, I have a great example of my dad, so I'm very thankful for that. Well, today we are wrapping up our series, and this is really going somewhere because today the person um, that we're talking about meeting Jesus, you know, we've been through the whole list of everybody that Jesus met practically in the past couple of months. Today we're talking about Jesus and his father. So um, <clears throat> I really think that what Jesus came to, part of what he came to show us was that his relationship with his father is really similar to our relationship with his father, our father. And also, I think we miss this sometimes, but it's also similar to our relationship with one another, with the kind of relationship that he wanted to establish between us. Um, and um, so I, as followers of Jesus, as believers, as Christians, you know what Christians mean? You know what the word Christian means? Christ followers? <coughs> like Christ. Like Christ. Christ. You should know of everybody since it's I your know. name. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Kristen, Christian, the same name. Um, Christ-like. So, so we represent <laughs> God. Christ-like. We, we, as followers of God, represent him in this world but we also represent one another. If you're a Christian and you're like God, then I'm representing you too. Um, so, so that's kind of where I want us to, to look today at, at that thought that, that how Jesus is with God is also how we should be with, with one another. Um, our scripture today is from John 17, verses 25 and 26. Jesus is praying in this passage, and he says, Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that, this is why, in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. 
Now, John 17. By, by this time in Jesus' ministry, whether they liked him or not, or whether they really believed in him, became followers of him, most of the people knew who he was. They knew about him. They knew um, that he was a teacher. And he had done enough miracles. He had performed enough miraculous things like making blind people see and raising people from the dead and feeding 5,000, all those things that, that Jesus did. He had done enough of them for there to be kind of a consensus in the area that Jesus is different from any other teacher that's ever come. Jesus says he's God, and all of these things that he is doing is proof that he came from God to show us um, God. So, so in, their, in their culture, even though they may not have been Christians, they, they at least knew who he was. Um, and all the people that we've talked about over the last couple months, those people that um, Pastor Chris mentioned earlier, the, the people that Jesus met, the the outcasts, the children, the, um, his disciples, the religious leaders, his family, all, all those people that we've been talking about, they, they, knew, they knew the part that God had come to us. Because they were all, they were all Jewish. They had all been, been living with a hope that a Messiah would come. They had an expectation, probably more so then than now, that the Messiah was going to come because they were much more religious than most Jews are today. Because most Jews are more Jew in name, kind of like a lot of Christians are Christian in name. <laughs> so they had this hope, and so Jesus was doing all the things that they expected the Messiah to do. So when he came, they kind of said, okay, I believe that's who he must be. But they had a problem with him to some degree. And the problem was that they were expecting the Messiah to come a certain way. They were expecting the Messiah to be, they're living under Roman oppression. They have their own country, their own customs, their own religion, their, their way of life. And now they've been overtaken by the Romans and they're having to live under Roman rule. And they're expecting now this must be the time when the Messiah is going to show up and deliver us from this. That's got to be the big deal, right? Uh, does that sound maybe a little familiar, you know, to the way a lot of Christians in America think these days? Surely Jesus is going to come before the election so I don't have to vote. Please. Or, <laughs> oh, my goodness. They're, but this is the way they lived. And... And their problem was the problem that they had with Jesus wasn't that he was doing miracles, because those were great, right? I mean, Jesus performed, he, he was healing people and making people better and all the things that he said he was going to do. He was setting people free from demonic oppression and all these things that he was doing were great. There was nothing negative that he did. But they had a problem with him because he wasn't doing what they expected him to do. Because their preconceived idea was that Jesus was going to act a certain, the Messiah was going to act a certain way when he came. And a lot of those ideas were based on, well, some of them were based on tradition, because a lot of tradition was handed down from parent to child, grandchild, and through the generations, things that weren't really in the Old Testament scripture became their beliefs about who God was. They knew about God, but they didn't know God. And, and at this point in history, God, there hadn't been a prophet. I mean, there hadn't been anything except routine religion for, for 400 years. Since the end of the Old Testament, Malachi was the last prophet, 400 years, no prophets, no voice of God, nothing except let's keep going to the temple, let's keep going to synagogues, let's keep doing the same old thing that we do every week. And so they had all those traditions that were being handed down to them that were becoming more tradition only instead of a heartfelt 
communication with God himself. Um, when after Jesus established the church and ascended into heaven and the apostles began preaching about the gospel, Paul wrote this, and he said, in the past, talking about way in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, in these last few decades, he says, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The son, the son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. That's, a, that's the way he starts out his letter, the Hebrews, his letter to the Jewish church, Jews who had become Christians. That Jesus, the Son, is the radiance of the glory of God. They know God's glorious. They've never seen it. They, they had never seen, I mean, it had been 400 years since the last prophet, and the last prophet was thousands of years since Moses had led their ancestors out of Egypt. So, so they were just living with passed on knowledge of who God was, but no real connection. And Paul says, when we saw Jesus, Jesus was the radiance of that glory of God. Now, did Jesus didn't go around shining. I mean, you know, when he walked into town, he didn't glow in the dark. He just looked like any other teacher that came through town. He was dirty. He walked on dirt roads and slept outside. Wasn't anything special about the way he looked. But he was the radiance of the glory of God. So get this. And the exact representation of his character. So really what Jesus came to do was to show all these people who knew about God but didn't know him how God wanted to relate to them. Everything we've been talking about the past couple of months with this Meeting with Jesus series, how Jesus interacted with these people. Um, think about it. The first week was Jesus and the outcasts, right? The publicans and sinners. Sinners. We're all sinners. Jesus and the outcast, the people that the religious people turned away. But how did Jesus, what happened? Jesus was ridiculed because he went to their house, because he had dinner with them, because he talked to them and made friends with them, and even called some of them to be his disciples. Jesus was willing to accept the ridicule of the people who thought they knew God best in order to show everybody who God really was. And then the next week we talked about those religious people, Jesus and the religious people, and how did Jesus treat the religious people the same way he treated the publicans and the sinners. He did. He didn't t treat them any different. Um, he also went to their homes, remember? The Pharisee, Simon, he went to his house. He met with Nicodemus at night, because Nicodemus once around and not let anybody know that he was talking to Jesus because it might ruin his religious reputation. Um, but the whole reason that Jesus communicated with the religious leaders was to call them away from their dead religion into a living relationship with God. To show them there's more to this than this whole God had already said it. I'm tired of all the feasts and all the sacrifices. All the prayers that you pray out of an empty heart, I, that, that doesn't get you anywhere. What I want is a living relationship to where you experience my character and you live out the life that I want to give you. Um, and man, then the, we talked about Jesus and the multitudes, Jesus and the crowds of people. If this doesn't... if I mean, these stories don't break down just about any barrier that would stand between somebody and God. I don't get it. Because Jesus was followed by thousands of people. He called the 12 disciples, yeah. But he also had other disciples who followed him besides just the 12 that he called. I mean, there was a whole group of people. And sometimes there were as many as 500 people just trudging down the road with him. And then when he showed up in town, 
where he hadn't been in a while, and everybody wanted to see him, and thousands of people came. And they were hungry, and Jesus fed them. Indiscriminately, Jesus fed them. He didn't say, let's separate the rich people from the poor people, or the men from the women, or separate them by races or nationality. Jesus didn't do any of that. He, he was willing to offer his grace to everybody without discriminating and without having them qualify for anything. Didn't that sound like a good news? I mean, doesn't that sound like something that the living, real God would do instead of this other caricature of God that they had created? And then, man, the next week after that, we talked about Jesus and the children. <sighs> he didn't even tell them to stay away because they were too little to understand. He just made sure they did. He didn't even have to talk to them. It doesn't even say that he said anything. It just said he put his hands on them. Sometimes that's all a kid wants, just to be touched, just to be affirmed, just to be noticed, get a little attention. And I'm good for the rest of the day. Sometimes this little kid's that way, too. Good morning, Marie. Good morning. Um, sometimes it's just that touch from Jesus that makes the difference in our day. And that's what, but he also used that as an opportunity to say to the adults, stop complicating the gospel so much. It's just not that hard. You need to become like a little child in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. Just accept it by faith. Jesus wants to be with you. Jesus created you to love you. Just wants a relationship. It's not that hard. And then, we talked about his disciples. You know, he called that ragtag group of guys together. Nobody else would pick those 12 people. I mean, if you were, if you were setting up your... Dream team. Dream team. <laughs> or your company, and you were looking for executives, or you had a plan that was going to change the world, and you were going to pick 12 guys who were going to... We got the tax collector, we got the fishermen, we've got the political activists. I mean, they just covered most of the ground. We got a who else was in there? Young, old, inexperienced, weathered up. All of them were covered in the twelve, and Jesus called them. And then he had to, all those others too, you know, the, they look like a bunch of hippies going down the road. Um, it's just the way they were. It's, it's, I think what he just really wanted to say, I mean, and including his family, part, parts of his, some of his family became his disciples. They followed him everywhere he went because they believed in him. Some didn't believe. I think Jesus really wanted to say, we're all the same. There just aren't the differences that we create. We'd like to think we're better than somebody else. Or we'd like to feel sorry for ourselves because somebody else thinks they're better than we are. Or we just put up so many walls. And Jesus says, everybody's just an ordinary person when you bring it down to what matters. What matters is that God created you to love you. What matters is that he put you here with a purpose. And once you figure out what that purpose is and begin living it, you'll be extraordinary in what you can accomplish. I mean, those guys did some amazing... We're here today because of what that little band of hippies did that 2,000 years ago. And all of that was to show us, to show them... And us, in turn, what God is really like. Not, not the God of the distant past. Not the God on a distant mountain. But remember the prophet prophesied that Jesus was going to be come, and he said his name will be called Emmanuel. 
which means God with us. Jesus came to be God with us, to, to show us a representation of the character of God, to reflect and radiate his glory in this world. And he called us to do it in turn, for us to do the same thing, to, to be Christ-like, to be a light, to shine a light in this world wherever we go. I also came to challenge our relationships with one another. Here we go. Because <laughs> the stranger is my brother. And the person who doesn't look like me is still my sister. The person that disagrees with me has a different opinion than my perfect, correct opinion. <laughs> There's my corny joke. Um, the person who thinks differently than I do. I'm still called to have respect for them. I'm still called to be in relationship with them. And is that getting harder and harder to do in this culture that we're developing in America? That's all I know. I don't know what's going on around the world. But the, the more our culture becomes a global cu culture, I think the, the more we'll see the importance of this kind of relationship with other people, that there's nobody different from me just because they think differently or look differently or live in a different place. Um, it's not easy, but boy, we'll sure have a lot of opportunities to lift this out. To you remember that verse back when Jesus prayed at the very beginning, he said, I've made you known to them and I will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them. Ooh. How much do you think God loved Jesus? Do you think you have that much love in you? I mean, back to him. We'll make it easy. Do you think you can, you can kind of try to love him back as much as he loves in this direction? We could never do it, but... But that part's not too hard. But what about when it starts spreading out this way? What about when I'm called to love Al as much as God loves Jesus? It's a tall word. <laughs> okay, that's really not that hard. Al's pretty lovable. How about the person that's going to vote for the other candidate? Or the person that roots for the other team? Or the person that lives on the other side of some imaginary border? Or, you get the point? The people that we find it easy to hate. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, 16, because of this love that we've received from God and that we're called to give to one another, he says, so from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though once we regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. So, we used to look at Christ in a worldly way, and then we found out, oh, he's God. He's not just another teacher. He's God. And so now we see him through an eternal lens. We, we look at him, and you know you do. You look at Jesus differently than you look at anybody else, right? You consider him in a different way. He's on a different level, and he should be. God is God. But in the same way that you don't look at him through worldly lens, you look at him through eternal lens, that's the way you're supposed to look at your brothers and sisters. We're not supposed to regard one another from a worldly point. No one. From now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Who does that leave out? No one. <laughs> so we're not looking at other people from a worldly point of view. We're looking at them in light of eternity, too. <coughs> so the person that I would just love to see off the planet for a minute, or forever. <sighs> Take a breath, count to ten, and think, how much does God love Jesus? One. <laughs> count to ten again. <laughs> You know the person that you hate, God loves in spite of you? <laughs> and he loves you in spite, in spite of him? 
regardless of how much damage they may have caused you. Because some of us have really been hurt bad. It's just true. Yeah. But there's not one unredeemable person on the planet. So if we look at Jesus through an eternal lens, we should look at our fellow travelers the same way. Because all those petty differences that we talked about, you know, like the other football team, Yankees, or whatever, you know, we just use so many labels. Whatever. They should not prevent me from seeing my brothers and sisters as anything except a child of God. I know, it's hard. And none of them should keep me from accomplishing the purpose that Jesus gave me, which is the whole theme of this two-month-long series, and that is go into all the world, and all the world, all the world, and preach this good news to every creature. So in the morning when I wake up, I have to think, you know, the person that I really rubs me the wrong way, maybe today's the day they get the good news that's going to turn their world around. So I certainly don't want to... My life would be miserable if I walked around wishing harm on people that didn't agree with me all the time. I mean, I would just live under a big cloud all the time. If, if I was constantly wishing the world would fall in on what's his name. <laughs> but instead, if I could start my day by saying, Lord, Please don't use me, but pick out one of your children to go to that person and give them some good news about Jesus and their relationship with God that will change their world, will change their attitude, that will make them act like Jesus toward me. And in, in my experience, when that starts happening, a lot of times I'm the one that gets changed. I'm the one who hears a bit of good news that I hadn't heard before that, oh, Maybe that person isn't as bad as I thought they were. Maybe it was me. Not all the time, because sometimes they're just skunks. But, you know, they just need Jesus. Um, but when Jesus said for us to go into all the world giving this good news of who God is and the relationship he wants with us to every creature, he doesn't leave anybody out. Even if you call them a dog, a dog's a creature. If you call them a skunk, a skunk is a creature. If you call them a rattlesnake, I'm not going to go all the way down the list of what you call people because we're in church. But, <laughs> but he said every creature. So, so what about you? Do you fit in one of those groups? Like the outcast or religious person? Or the person who just kind of hides in the crowd and nobody notices. Maybe one of those classifications has helped, kept you from realizing the truth about how God <laughs> feels about you. I'm, well, the church people told me I was an outcast, so God could never love me. Man, I've heard so many people, I have so many friends, and I invite them to come to Transformation House. Well, if I came there, the, the roof would cave up. Well, good, because we could get a new building. I'd be okay with that. Um, I mean, all kinds of stuff. That's not true, obviously. But they've been told so many lies in their lifetime that they believe they're not good enough to come to church or to have a relationship with God. Who is? Mm -hmm. Please tell me. None of us died on the cross. Jesus is the only one good. And he's the one who calls all of us into this relationship with God. So none of the classifications should keep us from experiencing God, from meeting Jesus for who he is. And at the very end of the book, at the end of Revelation, or at the end of the Bible, the book of Revelation, Jesus says this really strange thing. I mean, we've made it religious and 
oh, we know what it means because it's a religious statement. No, just listen to what he says. He said, look, I'm right here. I'm standing at the door, knocking on the door. And anybody that hears my voice and opens the door, I'm going to come in and what? Do you remember what he says? I'll come in and what? Eat. I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. What? Okay. Okay. Could we all sing just as I am? And we would like to invite you to come <laughs> and open your door to Jesus and let Jesus come in and eat. Does anybody say that? Let him come in and eat with you and let you eat with him. I mean, I know they use the scripture. But what in the world? But doesn't it make a little more sense in light of this that eating, fellowshipping with somebody is the most intimate kind of relationship outside of married relationship that, that we have with each other. We, we come together over a meal and it's sacred. What if it's hot dog? It doesn't have to be juice and crackers. If it's if it's a meal and we're together, it's a sacred thing because we're fellowshipping together. We're sharing our lives together. And it really is, the good news of the gospel really is that simple. Jesus wants to eat with you. He doesn't bring in his big list of, okay, stop, 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 stop. Start, 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 start. You've got to quit and start and quit and start. And you got to make up for all the lost time and all the mess ups. He doesn't bring it, that list in when he comes in. He just wants to eat with you. Can I just have a meal? Now it makes sense. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and him with me. Who wouldn't want that? Who wouldn't want the king of the universe to have fellowship? Just, man, if, you know, we, we okay, I'm going to quit with this. But we make up all these things, you know, like, well, you can't come in until I clean my house. I mean, don't come to my house until I get dressed and I clean my house. And I mean, even if you're the cleaning lady, don't come till I finish cleaning because I don't want you to see how messy I really am. And we have all this, just all this junk and all these man-made stuff in our heads that we think of. And Jesus is just at the door. Hello, Penny, Penny, Penny. <laughs> just knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I don't want to see how dirty or clean your house is. Don't care how you're dressed. I just want to eat with you. I want to say, let's throw the door open for everybody and let everybody come to the table and not let anybody stay out. So let's pray together. Jesus, you've given us such a great mission. such good news you've given us such an easy job and we've made it so hard you've complicated it and messed it up so much Jesus would you open our hearts to the people who are around us who desperately want to open the door but they're so afraid of what's on the other side because of all the things they've heard through the years, things that they've heard from their parents or from churches or pastors that were loud and wrong. Just let them hear your voice. Let us be the light that says it's okay. Even if you're afraid, open the door. Even if it hurts, open the door. Because what's waiting on the other side is so much better than the mess you're living in without Jesus.
Lord, today I don't have words enough to tell you how grateful I am that you chose to have a meal with me. In spite of the mess and in spite of everything that could have stopped a relationship, you came in anyway. I'm so grateful to you. Today you hear that knock and you hear Jesus' voice and you want to say to him, yes, would you just pray right now? Would you just say, Jesus, come in? It's really that simple. Jesus, I hear your voice. Jesus, I want you in my heart. I want you in my life. I want to believe the good news that you love me and that you redeem me. And that you've prepared an eternal life for me. Father, for any heart that's responding to you, any heart that the Holy Spirit is drawing and is saying, open the door. Thank you, Father, that as soon as there's a crack in the door, the rest of the, the rest of it is easy. You've already made a way for us to have fellowship with you, and we're grateful. We thank you, Jesus, that today, because of what you've done in our lives, you're going to change the world around us. Because we're going to say to the people around us, just let them in. Jesus, be glorified through our lives. Help us to love like you do. Help us not to be a stumbling block to any person around us. But let us be the light that you've called us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.